All right, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Barrett. I'm going to talk to you about some of the scheduling uh, where I'm writing in, uh, in BPF. Uh, basically, there's this intro to this thing called Flux. It's a framework for writing schedulers, and it's written uh, purely in BPF. I'm going to talk about that mostly to give you some uh, ideas about what we're trying to do, uh, but then mostly just so you can understand uh, what we needed to do to make this work in BPF. So the, the stuff that might be really interesting would be like some of the uh, data structures and how we did uh, object-oriented programming without function pointers and some other stuff. But uh, but first, let me just talk about Flux in maybe about five minutes or so. Uh, for those of you that were here last year, I uh, talked about how we do scheduling in Ghost. Ghost is a system we have. It's a kernel scheduling class with that where you have a BPF agent that makes that scheduling decisions. And you can do things like talk to user space and talk to an application through BPF maps. Uh, but the, the general idea is that BPF makes decisions and user space has a role. Uh, but I just mentioned that just as a framework for, for you to understand where we're, where we're coming from on this. And a ghost is really similar to a Sketty XT, for those of you who are familiar with that. Uh, the problem I was given is that I needed to design a scheduler given that we had large multi-core machines, possibly with crazy uh, cache topologies. Uh, and like we're, likewise, we're working on applications with different classes of threads or workloads. Uh, for instance, I might have a set of threads handling RPCs and, and another set doing housekeeping or something else. Uh, and the other interesting thing about this is that the set of available CPUs that I have access to as the kernel scheduler may change at runtime. Uh, for instance, we, we often yield to CFS uh, kernel threads and workers. Uh, you could also be running in a para-virtualized guest or you're sharing a machine with another uh, important application. Uh, the approach I took to solve this was to decompose the scheduler. Uh, I know that we have multiple CPUs. How about we make them a central component of the scheduler itself? Then the idea I had was, how about we dedicate certain CPUs to certain classes of threads in an app? Uh, and this is basically a way of, of partitioning a CPU so that threads of the same type run in the same partition. And these types are things like the RPC threads or housekeeping or something else like that. The idea then is that we can have what I call subschedulers for each of these thread types. And each subscheduler has its own policy. So RPC threads, for instance, I might want an earliest deadline first policy. Housekeeping threads, just give them FIFO or a fair share or something like that. Uh, but the, the important part is that I don't need to have a magic policy that works for all the thread types. Uh, and now, then I will have something like, what is my overall partitioning policy? Like I have maybe uh, 100 CPUs. Let's give housekeeping five. You have RPC threads to rest. Uh, but wait a second. Where does that partitioning policy come from, the five versus everything else? Well, the idea is that the CPU partitioning itself is scheduling. When I said give five CPUs to the housekeepers, well, that's an allocation of CPUs to subschedulers. And that itself is a scheduling decision. So you end up needing a scheduler of schedulers, which is always fun. And the way these schedulers are going to coordinate is through uh, the, the CPUs, sort of as a unit of currency. That, so whenever we're making requests or allocations, we're talking about CPUs. I actually think this is kind of a universal uh, scheduling concept whenever we talk, to, talk about like M to N scheduling uh, or even paravert scheduling. But uh, uh, so the end result was this framework we put together called Flux, where you compose an overall scheduler from a hierarchy of smaller subschedulers. And a given thread belongs to a single subscheduler at a time. CPUs themselves are allocated to subschedulers uh, in, a, in a hierarchy. And these subschedulers I keep talking about, they're really just blobs of code and data, like a little bit of functions and uh, maybe a run queue and a spin lock. Uh, and they exist in a parent-child relationship. And each subscheduler, when it gets its turn on the CPU, it either schedules a thread, one of its own threads, or a separate uh, child subscheduler. Uh, let me just give a quick picture of here's our Hello World scheduler with a global FIFO policy. And you got these three boxes here, each of which is a subscheduler. Uh, Rossi is one that's just a CPU scheduler, and it, it hands out CPUs. And it's a really dumb policy. It gives the BIF scheduler whatever it wants, and everything else goes to idle. Uh, BIF is another scheduler, and you'll notice I've got really short names for these things. It's because each one of them is really kind of a short blob of code, and it's not really super uh, complicated. BIF is just a thread scheduler. It's global FIFO. All it is is a run queue. And the idle scheduler is just it's, it's, it's sort of a half-baked scheduler. All it does is halt the CPU. And the way CPUs 
kind of flow through the system, like the CPU lifecycle is Biff will make a request and Rossi will get a call back saying, hey, you got a request for CPUs from Biff and you pick a CPU and you send maybe an IPI. Uh, so there's a bunch of little function calls where Rossi grants the CPU to Biff, Biff will either run it or yield. So you can sort of see, imagine how this works. Um, so that was just a whirlwind overview of Flux. There's not enough time to talk about Flux. Uh, and I wanted to focus on how we do this on BPF for this talk. And you can imagine all sorts of things from this, but just from what you've gathered so far, you can tell we have data structures of different types. There's different types of threads, different types of subschedulers. Uh, CPUs, they're important too in some way. So you're gonna need structs for those and we're gonna have a hierarchy. So are we dealing with pointers? Uh, you've got to make decisions, so link lists and trees. There's also stuff like callbacks. So there's a whole bunch of things that we need to do. So let me dive into what we do on the BPF side of the house to make all this work. Uh, the biggest thing we do is we do memory management through array maps. And just about every allocation we make is from an array map. Like So whether we're talking subschedulers or threads or even like per CPU data blobs. Uh, and they're all unmappable. And specifically, the reason I like the M mapping is that uh, I mentioned way back on one of the earlier slides is that our scheduler runs in BPF, but it actually communicates with a user space agent. And that can like adjust policy bits or something like that. And we also talk to an application who can tell us specific things. Like I mentioned, the RPC threads want to have a deadline. Well, that actually comes from the application itself. So it's really convenient to be able to M map these data structures. Uh, but since I'm using uh, an array map, well, there's there's no real pointers. So how do I get my pointers? Uh, basically, a pointer is really a dense integer in an implicit array. So I do have pointers in the code, like flux sked Rossi is a pointer. Uh, but it's really sked ID one, for instance, or some thread foo that might just be in the thread array number forty two. Uh, and we actually do have a, a map because a very common operation is to say, okay, thread IDs. Uh, how do I find for a given PID what is my index in the array? So we have a hash table map for that. Uh, but for the most part, the idea is that pointers are, are kind of integers. And once you think about that, we can actually build our own data structures. So for an example, we've got a, one of those BSD style link lists. Uh, I call them array lists, but the, the general point is the same, where you have uh, you know, your first and last pointers, but instead of pointers, they're integers. And each entry that you embed in the uh, in your struct, uh, instead of like next and prev being pointers, again they're just integers. Uh, and you can embed the link just like usual. And you can, of course, do do this numerous times. You can have an element be in, in you know, a dozen lists if you wanted. And uh, you know we have the usual operations like first, next, and prev and remove. Uh, but it is kind of a little kind of ugly because we do have to pass the array and the array size to every one of the operations. Um, I actually hide that with macros most of the time because the array size is pretty much always uh, a constant and whatnot. But um, we also have for each iteration, but of course it's BPF, so you can't loop forever. So we've got a little macro that says, oh, I want to loop uh, up to max number of times. But you know, you can basically build a linked list. Um, you're curious about it, maybe curious about why did we pass the array size? And we have to convince the verifier. Anytime we're converting from an index, like an integer to a pointer, we have to make sure that the verifier is happy with that. It basically has to make sure we stay inside the array map. Uh, the thing I do also is say index zero is no element. That just makes your life a lot easier. And so everything is really just minus one whenever I do the, uh, the conversion. Uh, and we got a little helper to, to do that for the given an array and an array size and an index, give me the pointer. And it's got some inline assembly uh, to make sure that the compiler doesn't uh, doesn't trick me. But essentially, that's just hey, what is the pointer for the array at index? You know, foo. Um, there's actually a very subtle point about locking when you with these arrays. So imagine you have this array map of the threads, and is it n elements of struct uh, flux thread? Well, anytime you did that, you would mean you would need to do a map lookup element call. Uh, which you can't do while holding a spin lock. It, the thing about that is that anytime I'm doing these list uh, manipulation operations, I'm usually going to be holding a spin lock. So what I did instead is I had it be an array map of a single item, and that single item is actually an array of n threads. The data layout is identical. Uh, in fact, user space, when I am map it, I don't tell it that it's an array of one of a giant thing. That's just a little trick I do to uh, to have the verifier. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll basically you know, do a BPF map lookup of that one giant array, do that outside the lock, and grab the lock, and then do my operations. Uh, it doesn't actually work for, for all the structures because some of my structures, like the flux sked, ha has a spin lock, and you can't put spin locks in interior structs, or uh, at least you couldn't when I, when I wrote this. And uh, that was an interesting thing. Um, but you know, link list isn't all you can do. We can do uh, AVL trees. Uh, basically, it's a, one of those self-balancing binary trees. Uh, I didn't do an RB tree, just uh, a couple of reasons. The big one is that uh, AVL is easier to implement. Um, and the other one is that it's denser than your RB tree. And I did want to limit the max AVL height. Uh, that, you know, if you ever look at the tree walking code, it's all while loops. But I replace those with something along the lines of like, wait, for, for I up to my max height. Uh, that does have the limitation that we can't stuff everything into the tree. Um, so that's that's a little unfortunate. Don't really have that happen often in practice, but in case I do, I do have an overflow linked list. And so on like my get min operation, uh, what I'll do is I'll check the overflow list as well as the tree, just so that I'll eventually pull items out of the uh, out of the list. But uh, it is one of the the, the drawbacks of, uh, of this style. Uh, we also have what I would call a half-baked uh, object-oriented programming style with unions. Um, so I mentioned we've got threads and subschedules and they're all different types, um, but the BPF map can only have a single type. So if you think about the two classic ways of hooking specific objects to generic ones, we have uh, the thing from the VFS where you'll have your generic struct like your inode, and then you'll have like a private blob on it, and then that private blob points to something like your ext inode. Uh, well, we don't want to do have more pointers in, in general, so let's not go with that. Uh, the other style that you'll see people do is embedding the object uh, in the specific object. So you'll have like your object foo, and inside it will be something else, and you'll use container of to get the generic thing. Um, the thing about uh, uh, us and BPF, though, is that we need all our objects to be the same size. So what I did was I added a union to the, to the object. So uh, each possible thread type gets a union member. And overall, the struct of, of the thread, for instance, is going to be the same size for everybody, regardless of your type. So let me show you uh, a picture. When I say, hey, we have this flux thread, uh, the generic part is it basically a struct at the top of it. And then everything else is in the union. So depending on whether you're a BIF thread or a DOC thread, which is a different type of scheduler, uh, depending on which one you are, you will then use that part of the union. But overall, the struct flux thread is all the exact same size so that I can have one giant map of all of them. Uh, this is a very different memory management style than the, the K-pointer style. And that, that's kind of the K-pointer style is more of like the managed memory where you do the object new and object drop. And if you do that, you do have access to like the list head and the RB tree stuff. Uh, and the, and the, the verifier knows what you're doing is kind of my understanding of that style. Uh, the style I'm dealing with is more of a, you have a blob of RAM and you can just build whatever you want. Uh, there's an overall array map. It's just up to us to allocate within it. It's almost like you started an OS from scratch and you just have all of memory and you have to make structure out of ones and zeros. Uh, and the verifier, the, its only role here is just making sure you stay inside the blob. And there's pros and cons for both of these. So on the K-pointer style, uh, nice thing is it's dynamic allocation. Um, the, uh, and the other thing is that the kernel can enforce invariance about your structures, like you can safely traverse the tree. Uh, for instance, you know, I had those, I have to convince the verifier that uh, I am you know, not running off the edge of my AVL tree, but, um, but the, you know, the kernel kind of in, in makes sure that your tree is fine for you. Uh, the downside though is verifier needs to know about your types. Uh, and you also need to associate your spin locks to your data structures, as far as I know. And there's some complicated stuff with the ownership model for memory. Um, but uh, the other one, at least from, from my perspective, that's a little tougher, is you need these k-funks and stuff and the helpers built into the kernel. So if you need a new structure, you need a kernel. That is a little harder for, for me where, where I'm working. Um, if you want a new operation, you know, you need new kernels. And the biggest one that I think might be that you can't touch the managed memory. Like for instance, uh, I talk about having user space uh, manipulating data structures at, at, at runtime, just maybe like atomic oring bits or something like that. Uh, you, you can't really atomic or a bit in a CPU bit mask from user space. Um, so that's that's one of the, the things that having it be just a blob of memory that uh, puts it into our, our hands um, 
means it means things are a little bit easier to, to work with. But uh, similarly, there's pros and cons of the blob or RAM style. The big one I like, as I mentioned, is it's mmappable by user space, but there's no guardrails whatsoever. So if you corrupt the data structure, you're on your own. The verifier is just making sure that you stayed inside your blob. It doesn't, it protects itself, but not you. Uh, it's also hard to convince the verifier your code terminates, like that AVL tree stuff I mentioned. It's pretty branchy, so that's a lot of states. And uh, I had to do a bunch of other little things just to make, a, make it pass verification. By comparison, if you call a kernel funk, uh, a K funk helper for your, you know, your RB tree stuff, well, the verifier just knows it's good because it's kernel code. Um, the other thing that is kind of a downside is we have a giant blob of RAM, let's waste kernel memory because, you know, I needed to pre-allocate space for all my threads. That could be a lot of threads. And uh, I definitely would like to not map that in until necessary. Uh, one of the things we were talking about was that it is possible, we think we can make it so that you can fault in the array map on demand instead of populating it. Uh, that would be pretty useful. That means I would uh, only waste as much RAM as I ever used. Um, still not still not that great, but it, so it is a con of this style. Um, but that was about it on the data structure side. Let me talk a little bit about the function pointer stuff. Uh, well, there are no function pointers, but you may be wondering how we get from a request for CPUs to like a callback. Um, the, uh, you'd expect something like, typically you'd say, hey, I have a function pointer struct called ops and I wanna call the request for CPUs. Uh, I don't have function pointers, but I do have every subscheduler and thread having a type. So meaning that uh, a subscheduler has an ID and every thread has a known uh, subscheduler that it belongs to. So I have a lot of macros that generate switch statements so that I would say something like, hey, my pick next task function is really just a switch based on the scheduler's type. And then there's some other horrendous macro that your actual scheduler agent will define. And that'll, that'll look something like this here where I'm generating the case uh, statements for that switch. So if you were a type housekeeping, you want to be handled by the BIF scheduler is kind of what this means. And if you're an RPC thread, Going to be handled by this other scheduler called doc. Um, and these are kind of similar to function pointers, but it's it's done with uh, switch statements. And uh, the thing that I find is interesting about this is that, you know, with Flux, we talk about how we're composing our, our scheduling agent from subschedulers. You actually pound include the real C files themselves, which, uh, which is always fun to do. Uh, because the ultimately, this BPF program is going to be just one blob of code that's all thrown together. Uh, so talk a little bit about our future plans. Uh, big stuff, I, we do have some code and it is sitting in one of our uh, ghost user space repos, various things like the flux headers and uh, how, how you do like the queues and the AVL code and all that. It, it is built on top of ghost. Uh, the linked list and AVL trees are actually independent of flux, so anyone could just grab those. And if you wanted to just do the style of building data structures and memory, that that's kind of independent of Ghost and Flux and anything else. That can be used in any any programs if you like that style. But uh, uh, speaking of open source, uh, even though it's not directly related to Flux or BPF, I was asked to uh, relate to everybody that we are committed to upstreaming our changes in general and that our cadence for our production kernel follows the LTS stable kernel. So whichever one is next, apparently we're gonna be tracking. Um, as far as open sourcing Ghost stuff goes, though, we do have this overall vision of building Ghost on top of uh, Sketty XT. And specifically, this Flux business I was talking about, we want to port it on top of uh, Sketty XT directly instead of uh, using our existing like Ghost kernel code. Uh, I do have an open question, though, of whether do I want to stick with my existing blobs and memory style or if I want to switch over to the, uh, the K pointers style. Um, the uh, probably in the short term keep keep with my 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 style, but uh, it is something that's that's interesting. Um, and the ultimate goal I have is that any scheduler that we're writing for Flux on Ghost will work reasonably easily on Flux on Sketty XT. But um, but yeah, anyway, that's kind of the whirlwind tour of, of some of this stuff. Uh, but the takeaway is that we do have this framework called Flux. It's for building schedulers from a hierarchy of subschedulers. And there's a lot more to cover, uh, maybe in some other time or some other venue when we can go into more detail on it. And uh, for your own BPF programs, you can basically build anything out of a blob of memory, even a BPF. And it's just going with this pointers is a uh, really arrays plus integers style. And maybe if you have some patience and, and uh, willing to dive into a little bit of macros, you can maybe even do some object-oriented programming. But uh, if anyone's got any questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, thanks a lot.
So hi, Barrett. Uh, I had a question. So uh, you mentioned that you use uh, spin locks to synchronize access to these uh, like data structures that you build out of uh, the array maps. So do you also yeah. modify them from user space, or are you only modifying them from inside the kernel? Typically, just from inside the kernel, because otherwise it would be a mess with the because you know you can't yeah. grab the spin lock. Um, one of the people I work with was talking about, and he, yeah, he hasn't done this yet, but talking about one of those uh, data structures that it can be like lock-free, you know, heaps or something along those lines. Uh, he, I haven't seen the code for it yet, so I don't know what the deal is on that. But um, but it could, conceptually, if you had any any shared memory data structure, you could you could do it uh, between user space and BPF. Uh, in earlier versions of some of our scheduling stuff, we had some. Uh, Similar to BPF ring buffers, we had stuff where either BPF or user space could stuff things into a into a run queue. Um, but it's not this style of run queue with like linked lists and integer pointers. But um, yeah. I see a comment in chat too. It says, uh, "Maybe take a look over, uh, take a look at using BPF loop over your memory blob. Uh, limits for termination there are pretty high." And uh, yeah, thanks for the uh, pointer on that one. It is on the uh, the to do list. Uh, the one issue is, um, I think I forget if it's BPF loop or another one. I think BPF loop is the one that doesn't work when you're holding a spin lock. Um, but there are open coded uh, BPF iterators that I need to take a look at that I think work while you're holding spin locks. Uh, I think the open coded ones will have the same problem because right now the limitation is that you cannot do a function call while holding the spin lock. So the open coded ones also do iter new, then iter next, and then iter destroy. So that might not work either, I guess. Oh, good to know. I'll definitely definitely have to play with it. But um, one of the, the things that we're looking to do is um, I guess help the verifier with stuff related to our array maps in particular. Like, uh, um, for instance, I'd like to be able to hold a spin lock and then do a an array map lookup. Um, there, there's some weird niche reasons for wanting to do it, but uh, given that you know the array map accesses are jitted, and uh, if it gets jitted, it'd be nice to say, which I know they're going to be. Uh, if that's going to happen, then it'd be nice to not have the helper function check because we're not actually calling the helper anymore. But um, so there's a whole bunch of little things like that. And then the open uh, open coded iterators that uh, that would be nice to do. Um, and there is a comment in the chat about having open coded spin locks. It is then, you know, which um, that is something we've considered because you can do a at least a tri lock because uh, you have you have atomics. So you, you don't actually don't have to use BPS spin lock. But that, that's pretty funny, though. Uh, any other questions? Um, any questions? No? Okay. Uh, thank you, Barrett. Uh, cool. Thanks, thank everybody. You for the presentation.